you so much. Um, so uh, right before I get to introducing all our panelists here, we're just going to play a, a short little behind the scenes of the um, project that Heather was talking about of all the different shorts that we did, just so you can get a sense if you're not as familiar with virtual production as to what exactly it is that we're talking about. And just a little, I think it's four minutes long to give you a sense of, of what it is that we're talking about. And then I'll introduce everyone and we've got basically the top talent in the whole country here to discuss it. So if you have a question, these are the people who can answer it. Um, so let's roll that behind the scenes and then we'll dive in. This is the Vancouver film industry at its best. We went from Arctic tundra to desert. It's a living, breathing thing. And then we were on a bridge, and then we could have been in the jungle, and that's astonishing. This was a training opportunity, and yet it feels like we all made eight micro short films. Uh, Animism partnered with the DGC to uh, provide a space, uh, a workshop for the Directors Guild to, uh, to come together and explore the technology and kind of demystify some of the workflow of how to use this in a real production. We were approached by Animism and the DGC to put together this training. What ended up happening was it, it grew in scope and all of a sudden everybody got really involved and excited. I wanted to be a part of this because I know that this is the next stage of filmmaking and this is really the future. We're shooting on two-dimensional panels, but inside a 3D environment. And what brings that all together is the fact that we're tracking the camera so that as the camera moves, it creates a realistic level of parallax or shift between the three-dimensional objects inside that view window. So it appears as though everything is in 3D even though you're shooting on a 2D wall. We have walls that are LED, but we're still using motion capture to sort of track the location of the camera and how that translates into the 3D environment that we're projecting on the walls. We're really just expanding the toolkit that creators have to give them the opportunity to tell stories in ways that would have been cost prohibitive or just simply impossible before. They had told us that there would be the brain bar of technicians off to the side. And I remember glancing over and it looked like Mission Control in Houston. That was just distracting, so I didn't look over there anymore. But it was incredible to think of all of these technicians who are just helping me get what I think are the best shots to tell this story. I was a little worried that um, shooting in the volume would be too technical, that I wouldn't be able to get the performance and you know, the, the story, the artistic freedom that I wanted. Yeah. Great, cut. But I did. So it, it smashed my preconceptions of what is achievable. With virtual production, really, it's, it's a convergence of traditional tools and, and a traditional filmmaking tools and digital tools. The part that I find most exciting about it is, is just seeing people learn it. One of the benefits of shooting with the LED walls is that they provide reflections of the environment onto surfaces. So I figured if I could find the most reflective costuming and I guess accessories, then we would get the most out of the environment. There's a magic in this technology and I think the, what it opens up and allows for us as creators is just limitless. Usually a turnaround takes about 45 minutes, but this took us about 20 minutes and we had time to get all our shots. The flexibility is unparalleled. We've never had this before. As a producer, I think this will make so much more financial sense. I don't actually have to keep worrying about the light all the time. It's 12 hours of the same light, are you kidding me? That's a, oh yeah, that's a, a godsend. All the different directors were really, you know, helping each other out. And it was uh, great to hear from each director as soon as they got done with their session. They shared what they were learning with the directors after them. And cut! I think what I really learned from it and what I think all of us sort of took away is everything is possible with this technology. It's not going to hamper storytelling, it's going to increase our storytelling ability. Vancouver is a perfect spot for development of a virtual production film industry. There is already an enormous post hub here and a fantastic and very well resourced film community. Right now I'd say we're, we're ready. We're mini Mandalorians now. If you want to continue working in film, I think this is the technology to learn. It's not new tech to us anymore, now it's just great tech. 
Just the things that we came up with with not very much money because we were working together toward the goal of making this community stronger and more employable because we understand a technology that is on the vanguard of the future and uh, I just am so excited that I got to be a part of that. All right, thank you. Uh, so now I'm going to introduce our esteemed panel here, starting with next to me. We've got who you just saw on the video there, uh, Stephen Calloway, uh, co-founder of Animism Studios. Uh, he co-founded the studio in 2017 and has had an incredible focus on developing the business and strategic growth of the company. And his team launched a production studio under the Animism banner that's helped with all sorts of full production pipeline stuff, including the uh, virtual production event that we did uh, last year in BC. Uh, so thank you, Stephen. Next to him, we got Matt Middleton, uh, production designer extraordinaire out of Toronto. Uh, Matt is the production designer. He's had uh, 20 years of experience in the film industry. He's also the supervising art director on Star Trek Discovery where he's uh, been instrumental in uh, the establishment of the holodeck, which is, was Canada's first virtual production stage um, a few years ago. And he's also served as the elected art director caucus rep in the DGC Ontario. He's uh, very passionate about building the industry there and has been a supervising producer. We worked very closely on a similar event to the video you just saw in Toronto that we did a few months ago. Matt was instrumental in, in making that event come together. We did eight more films in Toronto a few months ago with the help of Pixamundo. And uh, it was amazing to work with you, Matt. Excited to have you here. Um, and speaking of uh, Pixamundo, We've got uh, Gladys Tong next to Matt here. Gladys is the virtual production supervisor for Pixamundo's stage in Vancouver, um, which uh, for a moment, I don't know if it still is, but you're, it was the world's largest virtual volume, uh, which was pretty incredible. So she's in charge of that one. Um, she recently just wrapped the eight month marathon shoot of Netflix's upcoming uh, Avatar The Last, Last Airbender adaptation, where she served as the liaison between basically Netflix, the, all, all the creatives, and the Pixo VP team. She's also the founder and president of G Creative Productions, a Vancouver-based company specializing in onset interactive motion graphics, probably the company. <laughs> uh, if, if you ever need that, she's who you talk to. Um, and so she's an expert in this type of stuff. We're super excited to have you, Gladys. Uh, then we've got Steve next to her. Um, Steve Reed, uh, he is the head of studio for Versatile Media. Uh, here in Vancouver. Steve has been in the film industry for a very long time, since 1997. Uh, in 2008, he co-founded One Animation, which became the leading um, animation studio, one of them at least, in Singapore, doing lots of CGI TV and, and films. In 2020, um, he headed uh, here to Vancouver, opening Vancouver's um, headquarters for Versatile Media, uh, with a core focus on adapting and driving to this fully integrated virtual production pipeline. They're doing some really, really interesting stuff, kind of bringing uh, motion capture all the way through to virtual production into post. Um, and they are currently building an LED volume that should be online by, the, by early next year, maybe end of the year. Um, so an, another stage that's coming online that has some pretty amazing tech behind it that we'll hear about from you. And then lastly, at the end, we've got John. He's our location manager extraordinaire from Toronto. Uh, he's been working as location manager, scout, all that stuff for over 24 years. He's been the current president of the Location Managers Guild International, as well as um, being the uh, Directors Guild of Canada Ontario board member um, and current location uh, caucus rep. Uh, and he's a frequent speaker across the country on all things about sustainability, labor, workforce development, training, and the economic benefits of location-based shooting, and hopefully the benefits of virtual production shooting as well, unless you're here to tell us to stop doing this altogether. Um, <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Um, so we have an incredible uh, group here. We're going to dive into all sorts of different topics, both positive and negative, to really try and get um, all, the, the, all the different sides of this emerging tech. Um, first, just in case, I just wanted to make it as, as crystal clear as possible. I thought maybe I'd throw it over to you, Gladys. If you were to explain to, I don't know, you're at, you're at Thanksgiving dinner, you're, you're, you're explaining what virtual production is to your, to your family members that know nothing about it, how would you quickly kind of explain what it is? Have you been to dinner at my house? <laughs> it feels like you have. 
Unfortunately, Zach, I have um, I had a career before virtual production that my family didn't understand to begin with. So this, th I, I don't even broach this <laughs> subject. Um, but actually, I have a very simple one um, that to, uh, at Pixo, I think uh, the conversation, we try to define the term because it's like saying digital media. Um, so in, at Pixo, we, we actually refer to virtual pro production as in-camera vis effects. Super simple. <laughs> I like that. And um, they still don't understand that, but that, that sounds. I mean, that's the goal, really, is for it to be in camera. I want to talk about later about how much of it really does end up fully in camera. Um, and I think when a lot of people think of it, it's with a computer-generated background that's synced live to where the camera's moving to give you that sense of parallax. Um, but I was also thinking, Stephen, maybe you could talk briefly about. Um, it doesn't necessarily always have to be. Um, a, a, in a 3D generated live environment. There's also other options that you've played with as well. Yeah, we've done everything from um, uh, actually sending out small film crews to just collect plates uh, and then go back to the stage and film on that. So you're getting, a, it, from our perspective, it, it kind of really comes down to the budget of the project. Once you get into full 3D builds and motion capture, the budgets are can be quite prohibitive to a lot of places. So depending on the budget, we've, we've gone with 3D environments, we've gone with shooting plates. Um, we with set angles, we've gone out with 3D cameras, so at least we can, or 360 cameras, so at least we can, you know, have the full environment and be able to choose our angles. But we're still using footage uh, as opposed. And to if you're using footage, what are the restrictions to how you shoot it? <clears throat> to how we shoot it? Um, that's probably a question for the camera guys. <laughs> but um, I mean, you can't move the camera on the stage, if really, to some. Degree. Yeah, yeah, you're you're talking about a more traditional setup. You're not going to get any parallax in the. In the uh, in the video at all, so it's it's kind of more you're setting you're choosing your angles that you're going to shoot when you're out on location, and you're just using the stage as a way to kind of like like it was said in the video, you can keep your you, know, you can keep the light for 12 hours, you can control the setting, you can you know control the time that you have the stage, and you don't have to worry so much about locations and security and all that kind of stuff. So um, we've done a hybrid of that, um, but to touch on virtual production as well in different capacities, we've used it for. Um, we've also used it on location for. Um, for if there is going to be 3D creatures involved, uh, for just on an iPad or an iPhone, you can use that to to kind of map out where the creatures are going to be and what the scale looks like, so that you can kind of frame your shots better. So you're still even shooting on location, but still using virtual production in a normal production workflow. So you mean seeing the creature through the camera where it will be later? Is that what you mean? Uh, basically, as you're as you're blocking out the shot, you can you know if you're setting up your shot and you're you're blocking out your actors, um, you can have like an iPad or something that can overlay your creature on it. So you can you can immediately decide, oh, you know what, like we need to change the lens here because once we get this into post, uh, our creature is going to be way bigger than we thought and it's going to be out of frame. So um, so like we we use that and as as virtual production as well. Um, in different ways to to kind of in a way very similar like you're bringing the visual effects forward instead of shooting everything and then just saying well let's see what it looks like once the visual effects team gets it um, so we're, we're bringing it into the to the pre-planning stage and and uh, getting it out there and, and figuring out where you're going to shoot before you even get your talent there awesome I'm gonna throw over to you Steve uh, give me a sense of what what are the benefits of this type of tech like what are the best use scenarios for it what what are the things that you know this would be a perfect fit for? It's, they seem very simple questions, but they're really not. <laughs> I actually think your hardest question to Gladys was what is. I mean, I think that's something yeah. that you speak to anybody in the industry, you'll get a different answer. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> look, I think there's. I mean, you know, as a company, we versatile is really fully adopted virtual production as a workflow. We try and drop anything that's CPU driven or isn't coming off of a GPU. The core What's uh, just for the people here? What is a GPU? Uh, I'm, I'm going to keep stopping the conversation to, to get <laughs> definitions. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a component inside your computer that drives the visual graphics that you look at when you look at a computer monitor or a, a giant LED screen or whatever it is. Um, <coughs> Stand, stands for graphics processing unit. Is yes, that right? it is. Yes. yes, there you go. Yeah. Actually, that would have been an easier answer. <laughs> um, but I think it's, you know, I, I think over the, the goal or some of the mandates that we try and put forward is really trying to give creativity back to the creative drivers on a production. So your directors, your um, ADs, your grips, your, you know, 
what can we give them back that enables them to see Final Pixel when filming, if you can achieve Final Pixel when filming? Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of the technology we develop is to try and provide that, which I think over the past sort of 30 years with green screen shooting and sort of, you know, the film may be shooting for four or five months, but it might spend a year and a half in a VFX house. Um, and a lot of the key creatives that are there on set when filming are no longer involved in the VFX components. And I think trying to claw back some of those creative decisions made after filming whilst you're on set in that real-time environment, which brings that GPU word back into the forefront again. Awesome, yeah. I think I'm going to... I had a game I was going to play. I think it's a good time to play it now, where I'm going to run through a bunch of words, and you guys are going to define them so that every so that the, the rest of this conversation, we've gotten them out of the way. Uh, you mentioned Final Pixel, so what is that? What does Final Pixel mean? Why do people say that? Um, Final Pixel for, for my... Stance is basically the ability to film without having to do anything other than maybe editorial and color grading to finalize your image. So you're not going to have to add more CG later. It's, it's basically captured in camera. Correct. So when people say final pixel, they mean this visual effect is final, basically. We're capturing it as it is. Um, all right, who's going to... Maybe, John, I'll go over to you. If any of these... Are, when, when people say brain bar, what are they referring to when they say brain bar? I, I do pretty much presume it's all those people sitting off to the side on the couch. Yeah. 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 Oh, there's a, a big tent, obviously, sometimes. Maybe, Gladys, you can fill in the brain bar. What, what's, what's going on in the brain bar? It's a very catchy term, but there is another term uh, that is called volume control, which um, has more of a NASA feel, I think, to it. All of the above. I, it, this is actually what you're talking about is a very good... Uh, I think, discussion, because virtual production, it's been hyped so much. I mean, it's been a few years uh, lately, uh, especially during pandemic, and everyone's reading all the, uh, on their phones and iPads, reading all about this new technology. The terminology is really, really important. Um, it's like a computer, uh, computer speak. I'm sure you've met technicians and computer people who have throwing a whole bunch of acronyms at you and you're just, <laughs> you're just buried in tech speak. One of the things that I'm very passionate about is to demystify and simplify. Um, and that doesn't mean it's not sophisticated and uh, it's actually quite complicated. But I think I have a philosophy the, that uh, I, I aspire to, which is the more you know, the simpler it should be. Um, because you have the language, you have the knowledge, and you have the experience to be able to communicate very complex ideas in a very, you know, digestible, understandable, comprehensible way. And I don't find that to be the case in the industry, unfortunately. And I don't know if it's just my more simplified way of thinking of life. I don't want to lose my audience. And um, in fact, I want to be more inclusive. And these are terms that people talk about, but when they talk at you and they over explain and, and they don't answer your questions adequately because they don't really understand it themselves. And I'm guilty of, but I'm, I'm much simpler. I'll just say, I don't know. And uh, that you won't find that a lot in emerging technology. And I've seen this over 20 years. So I do think it's an important uh, discussion to start um, because I don't, I haven't found a lot of this is a great forum to have that discussion, especially to locations, because it's all about locations. If, if it's not visual effects, it's about locations. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. So who's in the brain bar, though? Who's sitting there? Who are those people in there? Do you have any? What would you say they are? Yeah, Steve, do you want to? Yeah. Got it? Oh, I just want to mention 50% yeah. of our Pixamondo brain bar are women. Perfect. I just want to put it out there. <laughs> Yeah, so your your brain bar is gonna uh, you're gonna have your screen techs that are turning on the screens, uh, doing any repairs that need to be done. You're gonna have your Unreal artists that are going to control what's on the screen. Uh, you might have, you know, a director calling out moving pieces of the environment or or changing lights or grading things. So so you basically have uh, artists, uh, Unreal artists on the side that can do those things in real time. As and what's Unreal? Unreal is a game engine uh, that's built by Epic Games. Um, so this is 
kind of the, the that's been the big driving force in in this technology uh, lately is this is a game engine that's used to running real time and so by you know in traditional visual effects we render things for hours and hours and hours per frame um, and this this game engine allows it to basically run 24 times a second 24 times a second um, maybe Matt you can take this one sure. what is blending or a blend day you hear that a lot blending yes. blend day uh, when you have a live background and you want your actors to interact with something that's physical and real, you have to marry up those two halves. And if you don't do that effectively, you break the illusion. It has to look seamless, integrated, all the way from the foreground through to the background. And that requires matching those two perfectly. And there's a whole range of techniques that you use. Uh, there can be physical techniques of matching the paint, matching the proportion of the items, making sure that physically built things are scanned and brought in as digital versions. And if you have, let's say, a road that goes into the wall and continues in the wall, it can be very tricky to have the color tone between a real pigment of paint being illuminated by real lights and the digital representation of that, the pixels on the screen, hit the perfect match. So uh, it's a lighting thing. On the digital side, there's special tools that are used to essentially Photoshop and color correct specific regions in there in order to uh, make that be perfectly seamless so that the audience is left guessing where the real ends and the unreal begins. And it's a really, t can be a time consuming thing. And a new thing that will appear on your schedules is something called a blend day, where literally the, a whole day j before the, the crew even arrives at the stage where they're just trying to dial in that that scene between the unreal and the real. Um, and so you can start to see that on the schedules of, of shoots now, this new type of day that's that's happening. Um, I think last one I want to just touch on because it comes up maybe uh, either Steve or Gladys, um, the frustrum. I think that's a, that's a word that a lot of people get really thrown by. Yeah, that one is... Uh I, I want to go back to brain bar. I just okay, want to say it. <laughs> it's a terrible term. Does it mean that everybody else is not contributing <laughs> their brains? It's yeah. just, anyway, I just wanted to mention that. I love that. Um, frustum is just simply a rectangle on the wall that represents the perspective of the camera. So you have a tracker on the camera, and it just tracks where in the physical space the camera is. And when it points, and sometimes you can have two of them, because you have two cameras shooting, you'll have two rectangles. I know I'm sounding really simple, but I really do want to make it a balance between terminology that can have a very, very complicated um, explanation. But it's really just the perspective in the virtual, because it's the gaming engine that's reflected on the wall. So it's just tracking this camera, the perspective, you get a rectangle, so it's the rectangles are frustums. Yeah, it's basically what the camera can see. Um, awesome. Well, we're going to dive into a bunch of different topics. I feel like we've got a good base of what it is and, and the words that, that you pr guys will probably use. I'll stop you again if you say any other ones. Um, Matt, I was thinking you, you sit, I think, in a really, really interesting place in this whole conversation because with virtual production, a huge amount of stuff that would happen in post, even to some degree outside the purview of the art department, is now being brought in uh, into prep. And why don't you give a sense, and we'll go around the room and talk more about it, but what is sort of the pipeline from script and idea to shooting on the stage? And how does the, how does the art department fit into that and, and all the different elements of, of what you guys, but like from script to shooting, like what, how is that different than it was before? I don't think it has changed much, to be honest. Uh, there's one very distinct change, and that's the uh, the drawing of the VFX team into the pre-stage, into the prep. And uh, on, a, on a complex creative project, um, like I have the fortune to be on Star Trek Discovery, and we have very high concepts. The, uh, the stories come to us from the writing team. We have an early discussion where we get a story arc, we get a season arc, uh, and then there's uh, a beat sheet that we'll get early on. And this allows us to be working months, months in advance, uh, usually up to five or six months, sometimes seven months in advance of the actual shooting. And 
at that point, we start to have discussions, concept meetings between our, our, uh, our writers. Our, we have our head writer is Michelle Paradise with uh, Paramount in, uh, uh, down in LA. And the production designer, Doug McCullough, will have uh, conversations with her and with Olatunde. And they will discuss what it is that the story uh, needs visually and creatively. And we as the art department will put together uh, style boards, references, uh, initial gestural studies, and start to work through some of those ideas and get out ahead of it. We'll also have an early discussion about uh, how we aim to achieve these various things. If it's on our standing sets, it's pretty obvious we're going to use those things. If there's anything new that's being introduced, we'll probably have to build that new. Sometimes we have uh, whole new sets that are being built, and depending on the scope of those, they, they have a very long timeline. So we're used to having a long timeline to build. With the addition of uh, virtual production, specifically LED volume uh, work, because virtual production is really this big umbrella, with the introduction of that, uh, we are adding one more uh, end that we're trying to get to, but it's the same process. We're having those discussions. We're talking about how we're going to do it, what it looks like, how big is it, uh, figuring out the references. And then as soon as we get to a point where our production designer and our showrunner and uh, our producing director have come to an agreement and have a creative kernel that they believe is, is the thing that they're trying to achieve, we immediately have a conversation with our counterparts at Pixel, with their virtual production team and the uh, virtual art department that they have at Pixel, and we start to workshop. And what's the virtual art department? Oh, or the, yeah. the virtual art department, I mean, it's working with virtual tools to create things and developing sets, settings, I should say, environments specifically for LED volume production. So. Uh, obviously, the people in VFX are highly talented artists, technicians, creators themselves. And I guess you have to kind of back up and realize that initially, all the work was happening in uh, traditional Hollywood, Hollywood at its heyday, on the sound stage or on the back lot. And they were using backings. They were using glass, glass uh, painted, painted mats they were doing all these tricks and, and using these tricks of the trade that were evolving. And it was all happening for capture on the day of shooting. That was the goal. Or they would have you know, a little splinter unit that would pick up these uh, glass mat shots and things like that. But once the, uh, the VFX paradigm of using a green screen or blue screen entered the picture, there was additional time for that maybe you know, several weeks after to months after, and as the scope of that increased, it became these year-long timelines of, of uh, post-production that essentially, had, there was an unnatural schism between those artists and, tech, and technicians and creators that uh, brought all that work into post-production and separated it from the work happening on the set. And I think that, that schism, I mean, uh, it allows it allows fantastic work to be done. So you can't discount it, you can't say, you know, working with a green screen is bad because we can see these are amazing things that are produced. And what we can do now with the, uh, with the volumes is you can kind of claw that work back onto the stage where you have that creative dynamic in real time with the directors, the writers, the actors, all the key technicians, the director of photography, all working together in the volume together yeah. and you can create those magical moments and, and adjustments and everyone knows who's been on a set. It's, it's a real energy and special thing that happens there where all these combined minds working together can achieve things and can deal with problems and can you know, uh, solve, solve timing issues or creative issues, things that come up in the moment, in the spot and it's not gonna take weeks of back and forth uh, between a, a VFX house and the producers or writers who might be on another project and the director and they, they're trying to get that and maybe the director's on 
you know, on something else, and the production designer is gone, and you don't have you know the, the initial team that was there doing it to explain the rest. brings a lot of the artists all together. At you want to get it all yeah. back together again? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, John, I wanted to talk to you about this uh, locations hellscape that we're looking at now. Of you know, you've rep a lot of the uh, location managers across the country. A lot of this is happening in Ontario in your in your home province. What has been your experience of sort of is this the end of location management as we know it, or is there what is the new role for the location manager in all of this? Simply put, no. I mean, th this is 20 years ago when green screen was going to be the death of us all. You know, it's a new technology. We adapt. We learn. Those plates that you do shoot, someone has to go and find them. It's not a Google image search. A scout has to go out. You'd have to go out with a creative team sometimes to even figure out what will go on a volume, what will go, what will be realistic. I mean, what Matt said is virtual production is such an amorphous word. I mean, some of what I do is, is virtual as well. I'll go out with a drone and scout and, and map it all, and we'll send about wire models back to save production from having to go out there. But there's still always going to be a need for the people in this room to go out and actually find what needs to go on the screen. Awesome. And uh, Steve and Gladys, you guys both have studios that are, um, I'm curious on the sustainability side. Are there benefits here, or is it, or is it, an, is it, is it exactly net zero, or is it positive, or what are the sustainable implications of, of using a volume? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there's been an independent study, not by us, who claimed almost a 95% decrease in the amount of carbon dioxide you're outputting when filming in comparison to a location shoot, which you know I think very much depends on the location you're in. Um, in particular, if you're going out to the wilderness and you've got to bring diesels and, and generators and people and hotels and food and you're there for some time, it can be quite damaging to, those, to that environment. Um, that said, you know, we're building a ginormous screen which takes tons of electricity. I mean, we're upgrading our power into the building to 3.5 megawatts, which is a kind of mental amount of, of power to go into a building. <laughs> um, we're lucky in Vancouver that it's hydropower, which sort of also helps negate. But um, the general consensus from what we've been seeing on, uh, is that it is in, can be incredibly green compared to alternative methods. Also down to wastage. I mean, when you're working on an LED volume, you tend to build smaller sets. Um, and just the wastage you get when, when building ginormous sets in sound stages and the stuff you're throwing away, um, it, c it definitely helps in those areas too. So transportation and flights and all yeah. those included. Yeah, because you tend to, when you're doing virtual production, to some degree only build the stuff the actors touch or is right at the base of their feet um, rather than everything that you can see. Um, Gladys, you just came from an eight-month shoot in a volume, so... Is that true, what he just said? Was there a, a big savings from a sustainable uh, perspective? The shoot uh, just ended, so it's still very fresh. and um, <laughs> The pain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be honest, I, I don't think the data is in. And judging from the previous panel's um, discussion, I, I would be very reticent to do any comparison. And, and I wish, I mean, there is a dream. I, could, I wish I could tell you that that is it's much better, it's much greener, it's, but uh, I think uh, it's a bit naive to, to assume that because uh, it's actually quite com complicated. Sustainability, and uh, I think the previous discussion was a, was a really great highlight of that exact point. Um, so I would not make that conclusion, but I agree with what Stephen said, in the, and I hope all that data that we can actually gather the data. I think in the previous discussion about measuring carbon in a different way is is going to give us better, more accurate data. I, I'm a little cynical. Uh, I think the data is very skewed. It's a feel good kind of, um, you know, we want to feel good about it when we're on the sets, but I think uh, the gentleman in the audience brought up, the, the, I think, the recycling problem, <laughs> like something so simple, right? So um, I think the jury's out to be to be perfectly honest. Yeah. I, I think it's too soon. Yeah, too I mean, soon. there's a fundamental, not to be the naysayer, but technology needs to be replaced, and often. And that, leads, that, that does lead to waste. Totally, I mean, yeah. I mean, who's got a new iPhone? What'd you do with your old one? It has to be updated. It, has, it gets burned through. I, again, it probably will, but it's too soon to tell. Yeah, the I, I feel like um, the screen, this panels that are used for the screens right now, it's sort of like when digital cameras were f first coming out and like, 
every six months there was one that was so much better than the last one that all the ones that everyone was excited about that they had six months ago are, are now uh, no good. But, um, but yeah, it's very much in this sort of rocket ship mode. I'm curious to build on something you were just saying, Gladys, of the, like, the discussion that you bring up, Mike, about the recycling of sets. I, a lot of people have asked me the similar thing of the recycling of the assets. And there's a lot of complicated questions around who owns the virtual assets. So like if a if a environment is built, a, a rocky mountainside for a production, uh, can that be used on other productions or not? And can productions that are lower budget use assets that are available for free or do those need to be can you use stuff that's for free, or does it need to be compressed and and you know done on the shoot we did with uh, with you guys? We did end up using free environments, but there was weeks of work that was needed to to optimize those free environments to work. So I'm just curious. Um, you know, obviously Netflix just spent God knows how much money building all these things for Airbender. Can that can those assets be used on anything any ever again, or who owns them? Yeah, it's a that's a that's a great point because I, we went through. Um, I think between 20 to 30 different environments, locations, we'll say. Um, a lot of them were fantasy ones, so they didn't exist in real life, which uh, made sense to do it in virtual production. Um, and that is actually one of the things that I feel is very important. And, you know, because we're talking about locations, it's no different in the traditional sense of making judgments about what you do produce and what makes sense. And part of that conversation should be woven by sustainability and cost and you know all the factors that we want to consider um, because it's not just you get a script and you build the whole thing in virtual production. It, it actually needs to have a process to sort of decide and I think all those factors can come into play. Um, but Netflix actually had with, I think with out of the 20 to 30 different environments, um, each lighting setup and I was going to talk about skies as another reason for jobs still being relevant uh, just because we have virtual production. We still need a lot of great references, assets, whether they're assets to be used, incorporated in the content, or it's just for inspiration. We still need the real world and nature to help us out. But the Netflix went through almost about 100 of these different scenarios out of the 20 to 30. So. When I think of the locations, I think of every time we have to reboot the computer or reset the environment, that's a load, and that was about 100 in eight episodes. And within each one, um, there are some duplicates, but they're digital assets, so they're, they're props that you digitize and you can bring in to the real world or the virtual world. And if, you know, I kept thinking, oh, if Netflix is really smart about this, they're gonna scan and digitize every single thing that, and we had full on set dressing and props. It was, it was a big production. And then you put in a database and then you reuse and then it becomes efficient, you know? But I think like everything else, these decisions aren't made because it makes sense. As we all know, filmmaking, sometimes we make decisions that don't make sense and it's because, you know, it costs too much to reuse it. It's much cheaper to dump it, right? Or we have to hire some another team to come in and do it. So the, those decisions are are all human based and nothing to do with sustainability, logic, yeah. or. And I'm, I know for the fantasy shows, it's maybe more specific. But I know that there's a lot of debate about if you scan an object that belongs to someone. And who owns the scan? Does it, is it the person who owns the copyright to the object, or is the scan now its own thing? Or how how much changed does that scan need to be to be its own thing? It's a really interesting. Um, That'll be the legal panel yeah, discussion it's, it's, on. And once again, tech is ahead of where the law is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you if we t obviously we can't take a photo of the Mona Lisa and put it in a movie, but you if you scanned a proprietary sculpture into 3D, could you have that 3D asset and resell it? It's very, very interesting to well, know. It goes back on our end too. If you Matterport someone's house for a certain production, you have a contract, can that be passed along to someone else? Right, yeah. Yeah, you wanna talk about the art department side of that? I just wanted to talk about the, uh, the reuse of assets. I mean, uh, on our production, we're finding that uh, some of the work that the VFX team is doing in building out the assets is also being used to uh, expedite the process in post-VFX. 
So that same setting provides the basis for the further shots. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Steve was talking about how, or I think uh, our director was talking about how some shots that you need to see as POVs that are super crisp, uh, you can't get that on the LED wall itself, that crisp, crisp POV. So they need to use that and render out those, those elements later. Um, but then Gladys also, I want to shift back. Gladys said something about you need that, you need the real nature to complement the work that's happening on the stage. And I think it's important for this audience to hear uh, that in the actual practice of, uh, I'm, I'm going to use Star Trek Discovery as a big budget paradigm. Uh, it's, a, it's a package of tools that we are using to achieve the various needs of the script. Uh, we're using stage sets in studio, primarily because that is the way to get the best page count with controlled conditions. And you can build those sets and you can come back to them again and again and again. And on episodic series, you need to have that home base where you can get guaranteed page count and uh, get a certain portion of your, of your script in camera efficiently every time. Then we have the new elements for our episode, which can either be a new built set, adding to our set, adding to our uh, our suite of sets, and those can those can be only for a single episode or multiple episodes. And usually, what we try and do is we do try to recycle that. We'll set up a set up a set for episode two. We'll take two episodes time to swing it into something else, and then you'll see it in episode five. We'll take two more episodes to swing it, and that work is happening while we're shooting on the other sets, or on location, or on the volume. So, uh, speaking of the locations, you need scope. You need you can't be just in these stage sets because you have limited st stage space. We have some of the biggest stages. We try to go big, but it gets cramped on a ship, and the away teams <laughs> need to go down to alien locations, <laughs> and they need to roam around and get into trouble and meet, meet the races and intervene if it's justified or that kind of thing. And They always throw away the prime directive every time. Every time. It's every like, time. There's I haven't seen an episode where they don't throw yeah, away the they prime directive. it, and then ultimately, you know, that this has like a hundred different ex exceptions. And you were saying before that there's like sort of about one volume per episode because you need time to, you can't be on the volume all for an entire episode because it needs a lot of prep work yes, within a block. Yes, so I'll, I'll just finish talking about the locations. We go, and since season one, we go regularly out on away missions to real world locations. And sometimes it's just the raw beauty that we find there. And sometimes, most of the time I would say, we augment it with other alien elements that we bring there. We take it and we get the 80% of the natural beauty that's available. And then we bring in, you know, a, a number of large pieces to make it alien, alien flora, fauna. Uh, there's you know digital creatures in the background or butterflies that get augmented uh, to help build it out. There might be a sky replacement that changes changes the uh, the, the color of the, of the sky, adds another sun or moon, that kind of thing, and uh, putting alien architecture in there or ruins or bones of a creature, and uh, that allows us to get big immersive worlds that you can climb up a hillside, you can get into the water and, and muck about, and you can do the things that, in the real world, I mean, it's out there, it's big, and it's available, and you can go and find fantastic things. And those aren't as, climbing up a hillside isn't as easily done in virtual production. No, you have, you have very severe space limitations that you have to work with. So then, uh, obviously, you can use green screen on a, on a green screen stage, and we've used that for a number of years. Uh, but in season four, we, our production made the decision to employ uh, a, a, a virtual production stage, an LED volume, and that became the mandate. In season three, we went to Iceland, and that was amazing, and we shot those vistas, but it was a small team. A, a smaller group went, and they had key cast, walk through the environment, and then get the scope, get the magnificence, waterfalls, glaciers, black sand beaches. And then we brought it back to the studio. And from those places, they then went into 
an, an, another environment that we could control on the soundstage. So then they could get all the dialogue coverage with a larger cast with the prosthetic support and the costumes and larger cast and the support crews that it's just uh, extremely expensive to take that huge production crew out, out on location. So yeah. uh, unless you're doing it within, within a, a, a localized, you know, within the zone, we call it in, in, uh, in Toronto. Well, there's a few other questions I want to get to because okay. we're, gonna run, we're running out of time and, I wanna, and then I want to make sure you guys have an opportunity to, to ask. Two burning questions I think lots of people are wondering about. Maybe Stephen, you, uh, you can start. Does this have to cost hundreds of millions of dollars and is there any room for smaller productions or what is the sort of cost of this or what is the range of cost for this? Is it is it out of the reach of everyone right now but it will be available soon or is it are there different options? Uh, well, in terms of just virtual production in general, the stage in general, uh, I think there are there are two options. One is you know, going with live action plates uh, is obviously once you, you don't involve Unreal Engine, you don't involve uh, motion capture, um, the costs go down significantly. And that's good for PMP type stuff too, right? Yeah, yeah, so. Uh, PMP, poor man's process. So usually when they're shooting car stuff, like people sitting in a car like Heather was talking about earlier. Yeah, um, that kind of stuff, uh, you know, what I'd like to see, especially here in Vancouver, because there's there is a lot of that that can be done in those stages. Um, you're not even really involving visual effects at that point. It's more of a production tool. Um, I, I think there's there's a way forward here where we can start to get that as more part of a just a essential part of every project. Um, wh why go to a visual effects house for driving comp shots when you can just put the footage up on the screens and shoot it? It, it doesn't make any sense. And even from our perspective, from a VFX company's perspective, driving comps are, are not where we think the money right. is spent. Yeah. Um, so I I would love to see that stuff take off more, and I think that is a good place to go for a lot of projects. Um, when you get into the bigger budgets, as soon as you're looking at 3D worlds, you are looking at a, a very large budget. And um, in terms of... And needing a lot of prep. A lot of prep. And in terms of that range, um, you know, again, we, we still do it anyways. If you, if you come to us with a green screen uh, and we have to build the environment in post, uh, it's still going to be very expensive. Now, you're, if you're bringing that cost to the forefront, um, it, it all comes down to the exact same conversations you'd be having with your VFX house right now, which is... You know your your quality bar is kind of dependent on your budget. Um, you know if if you're if you're coming with a very small budget, it's difficult to ask for the Mandalorian. Um, but uh, but if you're paying for the Mandalorian, I'd expect that you'd get that. Um, <laughs> but uh, so it's it's a difficult question for me to answer because it, sure. it just comes down to your schedule and your budget. And that's if you're willing to compromise quality. Because at the end of the day, it, it, the budget just determines how much time can be put into it. So yeah, how much does a house cost? Um, that's exactly it. Yeah. I want to quickly touch on these, and then we'll open up to questions. Um, maybe Gladys, like, what are the obst the big obstacles that the, that the sort of VP industry is facing right now, and sort of what are the next frontiers of things that need to be kind of still figured out, or to allow it to grow, or allow it to be more accessible? That's a really loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, almost every aspect, I would say, is a challenge. It's a very, it's a new uh, technology. Um, it's hardware and software evolving. So think of every version of, we use Unreal Engine as well as our 3D gaming engine. Every version is com vastly different. It's exponential. And so you're having to retrain people. So, I mean, every aspect, you name it, I can tell you a challenge. Uh, skill, uh, skill set is a big one. Labor force for having people who are knowledgeable enough to be um, useful. Uh, a lot of entry level people, so we need senior. So the training is a big part of it. Um, one of the other things I noticed is, it's not just you need visual effects people that know Unreal. You need ones that are okay to be in the hot seat in the middle of production, not in a hole somewhere for three weeks alone. Uh, they need to be. It's like live performance theater. Well, this is know. what I mean. Every yeah. aspect. If you uh, people who are really really good in visual effects, doesn't mean they're good in virtual production because it's live production. So. So then you get the problem of too many visual effects people in virtual production, not enough production people. And then you have production people who don't know anything about vir visual effects. So you've got this very, um, very big hole in the middle and, and you're trying to integrate the two. And I think that's where my, most of my work uh, on the show uh, was spent trying to bridge those, those two worlds. So awesome. It's a very complicated job to 
It's, um, I actually think yeah, that's Steve, one of the ahead. hardest things in the industry today is the talent, the technology that's around finding people with skill sets that seem very similar to what you look for in a virtual production environment is um, quite easy. Finding people that have the right temperament and want to be in that and, and thrive in an environment on set, which can be very stressful when you've got sort of directors and DPs and people screaming and actors that are not happy and VFX supervisors that are demanding things that are done a certain way. Um, it can get very stressful and not everybody can sort of thrive in an environment like that. That's very true. I, I would say the, the bigger problems, uh, and I, I made this observation not expecting to say this, but I was like, one day I thought, the technology is not the problem, it's the people. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> and then it's like, like it's, that's true for so many things. It is, yeah. Um, but if you do kind of realize that, um, I, I hope that that means that we can advance because it's not being limited by, uh, you know, people are, are thinking always about the technology. But it's uh, a lack of adoption from our filmmakers. I, I, we had some people who came first time and they walked on the set and I remember them saying, you know, just going as business as usual. Like, this, is, this was, uh, you know, a, less than a year ago, but it was the world's largest. And I had to, I, and, and I'm in awe. Every time I walk in, the scale, it's, it's, it's not like a picture. How you, big is it? It's, uh, it's 80 feet in diameter on one axis and 90 on the other. I think, I believe that's slightly bigger than the Mandalorian. It was like 75, I think. It's close, but... Um, and then it's about 27 to 30 feet. Uh, there's a riser, so so it's it's massive. And and I don't think it's this is the part. I actually want to just if I can interject about the human aspect about virtual production is what I find most fascinating. I spent so much time on the set that I actually found the reverse things that were you think oh technology is so great and it's so hyped, but what every time I walked outside. Um, it was like I kind of appreciated nature even more, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and you go, you look up because we do a lot of very realistic HDRI skies in in the volume, so that we can mimic nature, right? But then you actually go out and you look up and you see the same sort of clouds, but you go, that's real, mm. <laughs> right? So it, in some ways, all these assumptions that we make are dangerous, um, and I felt very much uh, inspired to be, you know physically going through the difficulty of a shoot to sort of get those insights rather than assume things. Because you do, when you read them, you, th you think you understand it intellectually. But there's a lot of things that happen when you're actually going through it that I think surprises yourself. All right, Steven, you want to say one thing? Yeah, we'll go to questions. Yeah, I just want to uh, jump on that and say, you know, from a, I think most of us in visual effects, uh, we don't have the skill sets to deal with clients. Um, that's, <laughs> that's just not something we do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I will say that you know for most of us being on set every day, so, some people have never been on set. Uh, I'd say the vast majority of VFX have never been on set, and uh, and so I think you know from from the production side of things, um, we do need to figure out either it's uh, it's uh, patience or maybe it's training courses of of what it's like to be on set. But I know one production where we had an Unreal artist kind of jump up and. And say, all right, everybody off this stage, we have to calibrate. And, and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, this is, th this is the first AD. Let's, um, let, let's talk to him. Um, but, uh, but um, yeah, I think, you know, whether it is, you know, some sort of prep classes to, to get people to understand it, um, there are going to be those, those things that we don't do properly because we, we, yeah. we didn't grow up in, on, on these stages. Well, there was a, an amazing moment at the end of the virtual production shoot we did in Toronto a few months ago with Pixo. The um, one of the Unreal artists was uh, had come out of the brain bar after four environments, four short films shot in, in you know, and like that's insanely fast for this type of stuff. Usually it's like one environment a week, and this was four in a day. And it is like he just had just done a touchdown at the Super Bowl. He was just jumping up and down from like just the, the live performance of having blended all those environments, created all that crazy stuff, and done it with all all within the time was pretty amazing. I'm just going to quickly, because we're running out of time, I want to get into some questions. Um, so please, throw up your hands, and we'll dive in. Yes, right here. I have a question. The um, Back to this whole where do we stand as location management, I noticed that the answers seem to be focused on the scouting side. You know, 
we all know that our job is, the, the first half is creative, the second half is logistical. Um, you made the point, uh, Steve, about you know not having to take all those people out into the world or smaller groups. I know when you're doing scans, there's maybe five or six people versus 150 people. So there is a there is a thought about what happens to the management side of the job as opposed to just the scouting side. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to direct this to you <laughs> because am I understanding that you spent eight months in a full volume? You see? So... <laughs> <laughs> That's they did let me out. <laughs> but that, that, that's my point. That is an entire film or series in this room, right? So I, I, I understand sh yeah. how I, much of that was really in well, the world. Well, it, it's, um, I, this was a very specific experience. So I, it is so new that it's hard to make generalizations uh, in fact, it's the, it's almost like each project is unique in virtual production at the moment. Mm -hmm. Vastly different. Uh, the requirements are different. The budgets are different. Um, there's another project uh, that's shooting in Vancouver at Mammoth Studios, which uh, have is also a virtual production show because it it has um, a stage uh, different from the one that we shot uh, Avatar on, and it's uh, the percentage is a lot lower. In, in, like they're they're interspersing real locations with the volume in the stage work, so it's basically stage work. So if your show requires a lot of stage work, it'd be no different, right? right. You'd be spending a lot of time. But the, you make a very good point. I mean, I'm not. I, I have uh, very limited knowledge in what location managers do and and the whole department. It's I I won't even begin. But I when I think about the other shows that I've done, nothing compares to this one. It was very intense. Uh, they, you know, people gave me statistics about how different this was from The Mandalorian and the comparison. You can't even speak of it in the same way. Um, it's, uh, I, I, yes, I did spend eight months, uh, six days a week. You know, it, it was brutal, very intense. But I actually, you know, and, and it, was, it was draining. But I found it uh, a bit of a privilege because it was, it's when you're involved in something so new, uh, it's 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 educational. It it was a privilege to be invited to by Pixo to be a part of it, uh, to learn from it, uh, to work with the amazing team. Um, I I'm a huge um, proponent of education and mentorship. So th this gave me a chance to bring more women into the into these this new tech, which I've been struggling with for over 20 years. So this is a, there's, there's, a, there's a lot to unpack and I think you know, if, if you have a specific question about something that I can answer, I'd be more useful, but you know, this is, it's a, such a big topic, it's hard to get into the meat of every, everything. But Glenn, yeah. on that show, there was a locations department. Yes. And you went on location in addition to shooting in the volume. Department. Yes, and, and on that point, because I've been speaking with the other production, um, there's some logistical issues uh, with the time of preparation for the, the digital uh, environments. And then not everything can be shot in, in, in the digital way, right? So there's time, there's actual creative reasons not to shoot everything in there. And then the, and trying to maneuver the changes. COVID was a, you know, a wrench that threw everything. And, and in fact, that's what uh, is happening to the productions. They're trying to figure out the balance between real locations and volume locations, like digital locations, and trying to work that in a seamless, with all the moving parts, <coughs> huge, huge challenge. Um, so I just had a conversation yesterday about that exact topic. Yeah, like Matt's show and his sister show, Strange New Worlds, do go on location quite a bit. They use the volume for when they need it. So it's, it's not like it's a complete replacement. Yeah, our experience with the volume is that uh, in order to change over the set to the next set, you have to first wrap out the one that was proceeding, then install the pieces. You have a pre-light at least a day. Sometimes there's technicians working for a number of days, setting up all the uh, the lighting integrations, 
Uh, there's physical, traditional stage lights up, up, so they're popping panels, bringing down pipe, adding the lights, and then you have a, a proper uh, pre-light and blend day, and then you have a technical rehearsal, and then following that, this season, we also have a technical blocker, which is where we allow Pixel to really dial it in so that on the day, we're gonna have the best result possible. And all that together adds up to a timeline that means that you're shooting uh, for a day to two to three every like week and a half to two weeks. And during the course of our, of our season, it means uh, maybe every second episode is getting a big environment. And then our, our first episode and our finale episode are getting a few. And we sort of work the schedule to achieve that. But in the mix, that's you know just one part of all these different ways of achieving uh, achieving our scenes that we're using. Yeah, awesome. I want to get a few more questions. Yeah, right here. Earlier, Matt, you said you bring in elements. You need physical elements that you actually place on stage, or are they digital elements? Absolutely. I mean, um, we saw the uh, the little demo at the beginning here, and I don't know if anyone else was asking why we don't see their feet. But the reason we don't see their feet is because they're standing on a soundstage that looks like that. And in the background, you have the projected surrounding environment. That's not going to cut it for a full, you know, a full budget uh, tier A production. You want to see them in the space. And if that's an alien environment, it's a big space. Our, our space is a little bit smaller than uh, the one used here for Avatar Airbender. And the Mandalorian, ours is about 70 feet across, 88 feet deep. It's like a horseshoe shape, and it covers 308 degrees. And in that, that's a big space. It's bigger than this auditorium. And you have to fill it with realistic, holds up to scrutiny. Actors can touch it, and you can give it a close-up. Alien, you know, natural environments with alien plants and rocks, or technical flooring for... Uh, say a shuttle bay or you know uh, an engineering set that's a lot of scenery to fill that up and that takes months of building that takes all those technicians bringing the light into it and uh, that's a lot of physical work to achieve those high-end things you go nature it's there you have an immersed environment yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can try like you can try to minimize that, but if you go too far, you end up with everything's on a flat plane, and you're always trying to break that plane, give elevation, and then if you go too high, uh, our our riser is up two feet from the stage floor, so you can have steam pipes, electrical, and uh, data power, so they can tie it into the uh, the control board for lighting. Above that, the ceiling with the LED panels on it, and some lights hung below starts to shrink that space. If you see that, then you have to clean that up. You're not getting the final pixel in camera. So you get this happening, you're getting compressed into this space, and well, hang on, why can't we just go bigger? We'll get bigger, bigger, bigger. But then you have uh, the unfortunate physics of light, which you don't have a sun, a sun illuminating everything in your soundstage. You're trying to replicate that with film lights, with LEDs and there's a fall off. So one of the things that the DPs found on pretty much every show that's been using us is uh, you can get a glow, you can get a glow, but you can't get uh, real shaping to the face. You need to have some film lights in there augmenting it. You can get the reflections of the environment and the ceiling, of the sky, of whatever's happening over on you know your reflective costumes like the Mandalorian's helmet, but as soon as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, you've got this dark void in the middle that's not getting, the DPs are looking at their light meters and they're like, re, re, you know, reacting with abject horror and going, this isn't, you know, what I was expecting. I have to do my traditional lighting and I want the efficiencies of shooting quickly. I want to be able to like go in there and so you have to solve that. So I think there's a kind of a magic point. Bigger, bigger, bigger isn't the way it's, it, it gets to a point where there's a sweet spot. There is a Goldilocks zone, in my opinion, and I feel like we're fairly close to it. We feel like we could use bigger room for staging, but it's compact enough that you can move quickly and then, uh, you know, reset your scene. They can walk for a bit. 
then you rejig a bit, they walk a little further, do things like that, or play with the camera angles. Yeah, there's also a lot of magic to the physical elements that are built in helping with the illusion. In the, in the one that we did, we, did a, we were underneath the Eiffel Tower in Paris, and we, we brought in full-scale um, street lamps. We had six real street lamps that were on the stage. They were then scanned, and there were 50 virtual street lamps that went off into the distance. And having the real ones there, your brain goes, okay, that's real. And then seeing the virtual ones repeated, you, you, your brain has trouble going real, 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 real. Wait, at some point those were fake, but I can't tell, even when you're standing there, sometimes you can't tell when the switch is. So in the design of the physical elements, looking for things that repeat is a really key way in making the illusion work. We, we, had, we did a, a castle and we had torches that were repeating for the same effect. There's also this amazing thing that Matt talks about where they do, they, they build symmetrical sets so that when you do the French reverse, because you only have a 270 or whatever, that you don't actually, like for example, that Paris set, we had our six practical street lamps, which didn't have to move if we were looking that way or this way. And so then you just rotate the environment 180 degrees and your physical things are in the right spot for looking the other way. And that um, they do a lot of that on Star Trek so that the turnarounds are almost uh, like are way faster. All right, one last question before we wrap it up. Yeah, right here. Uh, so I had a question. When you go out on location, you obviously deal with a lot of elements that you don't deal with uh, when you do the volume. Weather can shut down a whole day. You might have to pack it up or go to cover or something like that. Is there anything... Um, technological, that's like uh, a glitch, any kind of power failure, anything that you guys are terrified of that's equal and, and unpredictable? Yeah, what are the worst case scenarios where you, you pucker up? <laughs> Is this an insurance question here? Yeah, <laughs> yeah what's your version of the insurance day? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I can only speak from personal experience. I'm not sure how things run um, with uh, Steve, with your facility. But, um, yeah, I would say a, a lot of it is Unreal is still a software, mm -hmm. and software can crash. And uh, and so I think, you know, it's a, it's a very complex setup with how many processors are being used to get these images up on screen, and sometimes they just hang. Sometimes you got to reboot and reload. And so in a lot of the things that we've shot, it's it's not unusual to to shut down for 15 minutes while things get rebooted and put back up. Now, the the flip side to that is, you know, we're, we're shooting a lot faster. We're turning around a lot faster. And so I think overall, uh, the schedule is more um, more condensed. Uh, but yeah, you, you do have to be, things will go wrong. Things will absolutely go wrong. This is the discussion that I would like to say, you don't have to worry about your jobs <laughs> and <laughs> because we could have a whole discussion on the uh, difficulty and the things that it was partly intense because it was so stressful. You were worried about every little thing all the time. Um, even though I'm, I'm a worry wart to begin with, I, uh, I, there are two things to really pinpoint. One is locations are still going to be required for every film shoot for the foreseeable future. I... I'd bet on that, um, and that's coming from you know a, a techie perspective and and a bias even. And the second one is I think we all need to um, you know we're having these conversations because we we need to kind of evolve ourselves, right? We need to continue to uh, keep up with what is happening in the world, whether it's technological or sustainability or environmental or anything. And I think it's um, I, I just want it to be a positive message that this is not really about selling you guys virtual production. Um, it's an interesting technology. Hopefully it's educational. If you didn't hear about any of the stuff before, you're coming away with a little more insight into it. Uh, but it's a very human <coughs> nature to be feel insecure about our stability, our, our jobs, our future. Um, I think I can say for, and unless someone disagrees on this panel, um, I want to reassure you that we are still needing everything that we know we need. I think the question should be, how are we adapting to the new technology? How are we making it better for ourselves, um, not about the insecurity of losing, but um, the, quite the opposite? Um, and I, I hope that's the purpose of these discussions. Yeah, and just before we wrap up here, I just want to go across the panel um, and hear from each of you quickly if you've had, have you had a wow moment 
has there been a moment on set with this technology that's just made you go, holy shit? Uh, <laughs> John or Steve, uh, anything that's... Not yet. No? Uh, I, I would just, yeah, but then I'm, you know, easily pleased sometimes. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> let's, let's put that into some consideration. But yeah, I mean, look, just walking into a volume that's ginormous is quite an impressive and kind of awe-inspiring feeling, depending on what you've got displayed around you. It can feel... Um, yeah, you can feel very magical sometimes. Gladys, was there a wow moment on Airbender that you can talk about? There were many. Uh, I think I've touched on some. Uh, but I, I would say the power of your imagination being able to have it in camera, the wow moments have mostly been, you know, besides the standing and you're looking with your eyes at the, the size, the technology and all that, it was looking through the camera and uh, from a filmmaker's perspective, which is the objective here, the, the, the level of, of imagination being put on that frame was astounding. The possibilities. Yeah. Matt, uh, several, many, many different alien worlds. Was there, is there a moment of that kind of stands out in your mind? Uh, to be honest, it's been a, a mind-blowing journey. And uh, for our entire team, uh, we're always trying to, to push it and to... I mean, Star Trek Discovery is a very special place for all of us that work on it. Um, the uh, the legacy of this story is is one of inclusion, is one of charting a course for humanity, and the intention is to uh, break down barriers between people and to allow them to work together. And uh, we ha we imagine a, f a future of humanity that's out in the stars, where those you know, people of any uh, race, creed, color, orientation, and or origin story are working together to, you know, explore and, and adapt and change. Now, when we did an exercise earlier this season where we had somebody on a spaceship traveling in space and we saw that all in camera and it looked real in the camera that we were actually filming somebody on a space on a spaceship in space and you're going that that is happening right now <laughs> on this stage and like i mean it, it's it, it's kind of a we, yeah. we did it we're like you got to feel to you got to feel really warp speed space. Yeah, yeah that's awesome S steven how about you any wow moments uh yeah one of the early tests that we did with the volume was just a car car shot and uh so I jumped behind the wheel. We had 360 footage of driving down the street for a few minutes. And um, I got behind the wheel of the car. And I could see the car behind me in the rearview mirror. And the road was turning. And so when we looked at the footage later, uh, I was actually adjusting and checking my mirrors and looking at the side mirrors. And <laughs> as someone who watches a lot of movies and gets really uncomfortable when people drive like this, <laughs> and you're like, look at, look at the road. You have to look at the road. Um, I think like it, it just everything felt more natural, and so I, I thought like that element of virtual production and you know you, you have the real world to react to, and if actors have a real environment to look out to, and have specific points they can focus on as opposed to a green screen you're trying to imagine, um, the performances just become so much better. Yeah, in the event we did in Toronto, there was they uh, the Pixel team had made it so that the castle exploded into flame when the two lovers touched. And the actors could react and see. They could. They didn't need a cue for when the castle was exploding because they could see and feel the light around them, which was pretty amazing to see. All right. Well, thank you. These guests will be outside. You can ask them more questions. Thank you so much, and uh, look forward to uh, more conversations. Thanks.